Welcome back to Talent Talk with your host, Aiden Tolman. Today, I'm here with a special guest, author, journalist, and Tyrant alumni, Karen Naylor. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. So, uh, obviously, congratulations on publishing the, the book. That's got to be a huge feat for you, and it must be very exciting. How are you feeling about all of this, and uh, how does it feel to be now known as an author? Uh, it's It feels great. Um, it happened that it was published right after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So obviously around that time I was seeing a lot of people that I knew and lots of people were saying congratulations and people were posting things on social media like congratulations, this is so yeah. great. And um, it's funny, I, I never looked at it that way. Whenever I started this project, it was just something that I wanted to do. It was something I was doing to pass the time, which I'm sure we'll get into here in a couple of minutes. Yeah. But, um, but it feels great to hear everybody telling me congratulations. There mm -hmm. was a lot of people that said uh, that, that knew that I was doing this and helped me along the way and were part of the journey. But uh, it's a funny feeling too because whenever I finally hit publish, whenever I was finally done with it, it was more like just a deep sigh of relief. Yeah, hundred like, percent. Yeah, like that. That part is over now, and that feels really good. Mm -hmm. um, so. I try to tell people, while I appreciate all the congratulations and everything else, I don't know that it was that big of a feat. It was just something that I put a lot of effort into. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you put a lot of effort into something and you really want to do it, you can do almost anything. And um, I guess congratulations would be order, but it, in order, but it's just one of those things. I don't yeah. know. I feel funny about it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely feel you on that. So uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the book? Yeah, um, it's a two-volume book, and it covers the history of Tyrone football from – uh, Tyron High School football from its inception in 1921 right up until 2021. So the last season that gets covered in here is 2020, and that leads us mm -hmm. into this season that just passed. And uh, and we even go back a little bit before that because, um, again, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit, there was a, a ban on football in Tyrone for mm -hmm. many years in the 1800s and into the early 1900s. Yeah. So we talk about that, too, in the book. But really, it's a book that's based on a particular theme. So I try to tell people all the time, like, it might not be what you're expecting, but I think you'll like it. It's not mm -hmm. It's not something where you can open a chapter and, and you say, like, oh, I want to open the chapter to my senior year. Let's go to uh, 1973, and there's probably every game. It's not like that. It's a, it's a book that's based around a theme. And it's a book that tries to trace the history of the football team as it coincides with the history of the town. Yeah. And so um, whenever I think about Tyrone itself, I think about it, it's a place that I've lived all my life and I love mm -hmm. it. And, I, and I've, you know, for college and for other reasons, I've been other places, but I really love it here. Yeah. And, um, and I think whenever you look at the history of the town, it's a place that has had ups and downs. It's mm -hmm. a place that's had... Um, wild swings of ups and downs. There's been times whenever it's been up, up, like whenever the railroad was here. There yeah. are times whenever it's experienced very high highs, but there's also been times whenever there have been collapses. And mm -hmm. some of those collapses might include the railroad leaving. It might include um, part of the paper mill closing, um, businesses leaving. There was mm -hmm. a time whenever the town was divided in half by that highway that comes off at an exit down at the post office. Yeah. And there were plenty of times whenever people would have just as soon left the town for dead. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I try to emphasize in this book very early on in the first volume is um, Tyroners are stubborn by nature. They're kind of hard-headed by nature. <laughs> yeah, and I like definitely. that. I think that's something that makes this place great. Mm -hmm. and, and so they've always refused to die. And one of the yes. things that I say often in this book is it's hard to tell a Tyroner what to do. It's harder to tell them what not to do. 100%. There, there's just that <laughs> attitude in there. And, and that's one of the things that makes them great. But what I found interesting in my research and, and I noticed this really early on, and that was whenever I really got the direction for this book, mm -hmm. is that the football team follows the exact same trajectory. Mm -hmm. There are w swings of very high highs and very low lows. And each time, um, there were instances where maybe people would have just as soon left the team for dead. Mm -hmm. um, but each time, they were able to rise. And I think one of the things that helped the football team rise was just that attitude. Definitely. And you especially see it, I say this all the time, in Tyrone boys. Like, there's something yeah. in the psyche of a young Tyrone boy that wants to be stubborn, that wants to push back. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, and, and for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes for outstanding, um, really outstanding adults. Like, I think there's a, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of great people in this community, just that attitude. Um, and I think it can make for great sports teams because if mm -hmm. you can tap into that. 100%. The, the best coaches at this school have been coaches who are um, – stern kind of disciplinarians people who push back people mm -hmm. who are every bit as stubborn as the boys that they're coaching but also people who are able to recognize that attitude and harness it and put it in the right direction oh 100 i could 
completely agree with you on that one. So uh, what inspired you to uh, write this book? Yeah, well, it's funny. Um, for a long time, I've written Tyrone football stories. Mm -hmm. I've written for the Herald since my sophomore year in college. Yeah. And I first started out writing girls' basketball stories and um, baseball stories. As a matter of fact, uh, so I was young. Uh, I was probably only maybe 19 but the first baseball season I covered would have been your dad's senior season. Really? Yeah, and they went to the district finals that year and lost to Mount Union. Oh, but they had a great team. Definitely. They had won districts as juniors. Yeah, he is always talking about that. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a great team. And, and they were a bunch of good guys, too. And um, so that was what I did. And then when I graduated college, I just wanted to find something to do until I got a teaching job. Yeah. And then I wanted a teaching job. And the Herald asked, uh, would you like to work full-time here? So I became a full-time writer. And that fall... They wanted to get some special stories ready for their football tab. The mm -hmm. football team then was just reaching um, some of its prom, uh, prowess under John Franco since yeah. 1997. And um, and they wanted to do it up big. And so I thought, well, it's 1997. I remember when I was a freshman in 1987, there was a football team that won the district championship. And those guys were like my heroes. It was like yeah. Tom Getz and Bob Murdoff and Bill Kimberling and, mm -hmm. and like – I mean, if I walked down the hallway with those guys, I would be afraid to even make eye contact because <laughs> those guys were so cool. Yeah. And I'm like, I would like to do a story on that because we're really praising all these teams of, of the present, but I think people forget that. So I wrote this story called The Team That Time Forgot, where I talked to all those guys. I did a lot of research, mm -hmm. and I wrote a story about that. And I really like that. And, and it's a genre of writing that I like, like sports writing that does more than just tell statistics, mm -hmm. but it tells a story. Yeah. And so... I started doing that like once a year, I would do a special story like that for the football tab. And I kept on doing that. So flash forward to like 2018, I'm still writing these stories <laughs> like that every now and then. Yeah. And I had a student teacher uh, and her name was Miss Martin. Mm -hmm. She teaches here now, actually. I was going to say uh, that name. Yeah. Sounds familiar. Well, yeah. she's married and I, and I feel bad because I don't remember her married name, but, but <laughs> she was awesome as a student oh. teacher. But really, she was the one who said to me, like, well, if you want that to go out to a wider audience, why don't you try blogging? So I started to write these stories for a football blog that I have. Yeah. It's called Tyrone Football Stories. And uh, a couple of people would read them and then say to me, oh, this is awesome. You should collect these all together and do a book. And my response was always kind of like, <laughs> like a chuckle. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, like who would read this book that you're talking about? Yeah. Um, I could imagine like five people buying it and one of them is my dad. So does that really count <laughs> if, you, if you wrote a book and it's like that? So I just kept that on the back burner, and I thought maybe sometime. But I, mm -hmm. I always knew that I did want to write a book, um, probably from the time I was like 17. Like at 17, I started reading books that were um, history books and biographies. Yeah. And the longer I read them, the more I thought, well, I could actually do this. Like this isn't something that's, that's difficult. I don't mm -hmm. think, you know, I, th I think I could actually do this. So I knew I wanted to write a book. Okay, so March 13th, 2020 was the day the pandemic began for everybody. Mm. And... So I teach at Bellwood Annis High School, and at Bellwood that day, they made an announcement uh, late in the day, we're going to be closing for an hour because of coronavirus, mm -hmm. and this uh, we're going to be closed for an entire week, and we're trying to stop the spread. Yeah, and then it just kept going on and on after that, pretty much. Literally, before we left that day, <laughs> all the kids were gone, and the teachers were milling around in the hallway talking like, hey, uh, it's kind of like Christmas break, I guess we'll see you in a week or so. <laughs> How about it? And they made an announcement, two weeks. So we get home that night, and... Uh, there's a, I always do work. I have a, a sports room down in the basement. I was going mm -hmm. there by myself and do like writing stories for the Herald or whatever. Yeah. I went down there that night and I'm thinking like, what can I do for these next two weeks? I have no obligations because at mm -hmm. that time nobody was teaching online. It was just, yeah. you were closed. So I'm like, what can I do to pass this time? I'm like, I'm going to write that football book I've always thought about. And yeah. I'm like, I got two weeks. I could get this done in two weeks because I already have like seven stories that I could just, I'll just put them in order as far as the chapters go and I'll fill in the blanks. Yeah. And it turns out like, the idea of writing a book that spans 100 years in two weeks mm -hmm. is almost as naive as the idea of ending a global pandemic in two <laughs> weeks by shutting schools down. Yeah. So it, it became a passion for me. And obviously, I could keep on doing it throughout that, that school year. And then once the summer started, it really became like a drive where I was traveling to meet people. I was traveling to find artifacts. Mm -hmm. I was going to courthouses to find documents and so it was a big process but that was where it all started yeah. long answer for a good question <laughs> so that kind of ties into the next one so what like where did your research for the book come from like was it all like just common knowledge or like yeah. did you have to do a little bit of digging in like tyrant history books because i know my dad actually he has a book downstairs yep. that he likes to read and that has some of the football information yeah i did that too so some of it you like like 
I could write an outline with common knowledge more than likely, but mm -hmm. I couldn't write a whole book. So the first thing I did, I, uh, I got a subscription to a website called newspapers.com. And mm -hmm. this site has PDFs of almost every newspaper in the entire country going back to the 1800s. And, and there will be some years where they might only have three months instead of 12, or maybe they'll skip a year, but it's tons of information. I literally read thousands and saved thousands of stories on my wow. computer. So yeah, it definitely wasn't something that I did off the top of my head because it, as I said before, it's more than just a football book. It's also a history of the town book. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a book that your dad has. It's like a history of the town. It might be this one. There was a book that was written in 1950 by a guy who used to teach here. His name is Ralph Wolfgang. It's called mm -hmm. The History of Tyrone Burrow from 1850 to 1950. I actually think that is exactly what the book is. Because it's like, yeah. I remember, I went downstairs and he showed me. It's like, it's like a greenish like mm -hmm. thing with like small little plastic rings. Yes, it's got, yeah. the, it's got the ring binder. Yeah. And uh, it's a great book. Mm -hmm. and, and it's... Uh, it's really kind of a, I mean, a masterpiece if you're a, if you're a Tyrone or you Oh, 100%, book. yeah. Um, and so Mr. Richard Merriman gave me oh, a copy of that book. Oh, yes. And, um, and I read that and I thought, well, this is great, but it ends at 1950. Mm -hmm. Part of this book is like a humble, humble attempt to try to continue that. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned a lot of the things that Wolfgang talked about leading up to 1950, but as I was writing it very early on, I thought, you know, we have the history of Tyrone up until 1980, or excuse me, 1950, but what after that? Why not include yeah. that in here? Um, so, yeah, and, and so I did tons of research like that where I was always reading newspaper stories, always clipping newspaper stories, saving them. There would be times where I would reach a dead end and I couldn't find anything online. So mm -hmm. sometimes I would go to the Daily Herald office and use their microfilm. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a big section in there on the history of Grayfield and where Grayfield came from because before Tyrone played at Grayfield, they played at the Athletic Park, which is now out where I guess like Gardner's Candies and Albemarle is. Oh, really? Is that that like big grass field then? Yep. Yeah, oh, somewhere wow. around in there. The Athletic Park was a gigantic place mm -hmm. and uh, it was way more than a football slash baseball field. They did yeah. have an awesome baseball diamond, which. If you go out there now and go through the woods, you can still see the foundations of the dugouts and the grandstands really? and the baseball diamond, which is pretty cool. That's cool. Um, but it was an amazing field that had an Olympic swimming pool. It had a lagoon. It had croquet wow. courts, tennis courts. It had picnic areas. And in the heyday of the Pennsylvania Railroad, it was mm -hmm. a place where people would come to Tyrone to make day trips there yeah. and go to the athletic park and just be out. You mm -hmm. know, uh, in the early 20th century, the idea of free time and recreation time and places to have recreation time it, it was really kind of a novelty. Yeah. And so people were, would come here to spend time there. And I wanted to know, I mean, I think a lot of people know you could read the plaque down at the field that it's named after Ada Gray yeah. who donated some money to build the field. Mm -hmm. And I, and I knew that, um, I knew a little bit of the history. I've written about the history of it before, but I wanted to know more. Like, how did they even get this land? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that makes Grayfield amazing is um, it's not a place. Now, if you go to Bellwood, take a place like Bellwood. I think they have a, a great field up there. Oh, for sure. In, in I guess, 96 or 97, when they redid it, that mm -hmm. became one of the premier places in Blair County, and it's yeah. a beautiful place. But unlike a facility that's built on your campus, Mm-hmm. Grayfield is in the middle of town. Yeah, that's like you don't see that a lot. Yeah, of, yeah. it's kind of crazy that you have a field right in the middle of your town, and yeah. it reminds me of something like Wrigley Field in Chicago, where you 100 percent Fenway actually. and yeah, and they're Boston. just smack dab right in the middle. Yeah, so how do you acquire land that's right in the middle of yeah. town? So I wanted to know that. So I went to the Blair County Courthouse and just looked up all that land, and I found out I found all the deeds to it, and I found who owned it first and how did the district get it. And crazy enough, the district, this is in the book, but the district bought the original, basically the area for the football field, as well as the area behind it where that church is now. They yeah. turned that into a practice field. They got all that land for a dollar. So A dollar. Who, yeah, there was a family who owned that land and they wanted to do, basically donate it yeah. to, to the school and they gave it to them for a dollar. Wow. Which Ada Gray did bequeath the district uh, $10,000 when she mm -hmm. died, which would have been something like 160000 today. Yeah. And... This was in the middle of the Great Depression, so that was another thing that makes the story of Grayfield. That's more interesting. Yeah, yeah, it makes it really interesting because how do you have money for anything in the Great Depression? Yeah. But even more, how do you sell the community on the fact that, hey, the district, which draws from your tax dollars, wants to build this football field. Yeah. I know we already have one, but we <laughs> want to build another one right here. So how do you do that? And one of the ways was through that donation. One mm -hmm. of the ways was by getting it for a dollar. And another way was through... Um, 
like WPA and other depression era programs mm -hmm. that put people to work on the field. Yeah. So it's a really interesting story. And uh, yeah, so that was some of the stuff that I found out in my research. And then the last part of the research, r wrapping around your original question, was I, I interviewed like 48 people. 48 so people. So I talked to lots and lots of people for this book. Jeez. And I appreciate them. And in the back of the book, I tried to, I listed every single one that I did an actual interview with. So mm -hmm. there's also stories in here that I might have written 10 years ago that I reworked for this book. And yeah. I would include those interviews from 10 years ago in it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't include them in the list of interviews for this book, but new interviews for this book, it was like 48 people. Wow, that's crazy. So reading a little bit, like the synopsis of the book, you said something about a kid dying. Mm -hmm. Can you like expand upon that or like? Yeah, it was in 1897, Tyrone didn't have a football team. You can go back as early as like 1894 and you'll see at board meetings, the district laying down the law and having these yeah. decrees where it's like no one at this district will play football in the late 1800s and early 1900s wow. lots of people didn't play football because mm -hmm. it was viewed as a dangerous sport like you would have 30 people dying every year playing football this is before like helmets and all the all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff so that's definitely like yeah it, ma it makes sense yeah it does it was head injuries mostly yeah or getting trampled mm -hmm. so now when you think of football you think of okay, we have a center, we have five people on the line, we're gonna split out our wide receivers, yeah. we're gonna put this guy in motion. And what it does is it gives you lots and lots of space to move around. So a lot of times in today's game, when you're getting hit, you're gonna get hit by one guy, two mm -hmm. guys. Sometimes that can be dangerous, like yeah. back before they had targeting rules and you could just wallop somebody yeah. coming across the middle. So, but in general, that makes the game much safer. Back then, the game was much more compact, and you would mm -hmm. just have 11 people running at 11 people, yeah. trying to push them over. You would have a guy with a ball trying to get between them. Equipment was bad, and mm -hmm. it was a lot of trampling deaths, but especially a lot of head, head injuries. Wow, that's crazy. A lot of towns didn't want anything to do with this. You can go back and find newspaper articles from all across the country that are talking about, let's ban football. It's, yeah. it's, it's a terrible sport. Um, and even in Pennsylvania, they tried to pass laws against it. But... In 1897, we didn't have a high school football team here, but they had club teams all the time. And yeah. so this club team went to Bellwood. That's what makes this story pretty ironic, yeah. is that they went by train to Bellwood. They played a game. I've tried to find out forever where this game is. The best I can come is I think it was at that space before you turn right to go on the stadium drive across the road near where those baseball fields are now. Oh, yeah. I think, it, I think that's where the game was, although I haven't been able to find out for sure. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, to make a long story short, this man named Benjamin Rich, he was 22 years old. He was a pharmacist living in Tyrone. He was hit in the head. He collapsed. He tried to get off the field. He collapsed again. They took him to this nearby hotel, Jeez. which I think is that white house. It's a, they, it's, there's two, from what I've learned, there are two places in Bellwood that have been called the bell house. Mm -hmm. One of them is back near hometown market. The other one is out there on the oh, highway. Yeah. So it's near that big white place there. I think that was where they took him. Oh, but wow. before they got him there, he was dead. And so, mm. um, that story made national news yeah it i could only imagine yeah. yeah because in that in those days you would see at the end of every week newspapers publishing lists of people who were maimed injured or killed playing football it was like reading Jeez, yeah like a it, morgue it, it would be like yeah it's exactly <laughs> like that it's like uh in the 1960s during vietnam whenever they would publish the yeah. list of the dead it was just like that and that's so, crazy yes he died playing football and that helped to uphold that ban until 1921 mm -hmm. and, and so by then, I guess the the pain had worn away, I guess. But there yeah. were so many young people clamoring for it then. Mm -hmm. Altoona had a team. Holidaysburg had a team. Um, all the schools around Tyrone had a team. So it was kind of just Tyrone that, like, banned football for that certain amount of period, or I, that certain period. Yeah, I don't know that any other place banned it. And I always try wow. to compare it to this. Uh, if you've ever seen Footloose <laughs> and all those kids in Beaumont just yeah. want to dance, Everybody in Tyrone just wanted to play football. Yeah. Like these kids wanted to play, and they clamored for it and clamored mm -hmm. for it and clamored for and it. They got it eventually. They finally got it. Wow. And that's where the whole hard-headedness hard and stubbornness yeah, begins. Yeah, 100%. So uh, what was your favorite part about writing this book? Yeah, somebody asked me this last week. Uh, okay, my absolute favorite part, and there's lots of favorite parts. Like mm -hmm. you do it, I did it in sections, and so um, you kind of fall in love with each part while you're doing it because you're immersed in it. But my yeah. absolute favorite part would be um, there was a guy who went to Tyrone Area High School. His name was Slug Drake. Slug Drake. Slug Drake. Does that sound like a football name or what? <laughs> yeah. Um, so Slug Drake, he played in the late 1950s. He still lives out in Northwood now. Mm -hmm. Amazing guy. Great storyteller. But I, I tell people, um, if you think of people from Tyrone, or excuse me, if you think of people from Blair County recently who are 
highly recruited. You'd probably say Allie Campbell is at the top. Yeah. Course. So Allie went to Notre Dame. Allie's playing at Penn State right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and Allie was top 10 in the country in her class. Like, she's yeah. amazing. Like, I just suitors everywhere. The only person I can think that would come close to that, and I know Doug West was a big recruit, and people like Johnny Moore, there's, you know, Steve Tannehill went to South Carolina. There's a lot of big recruits. But as far as, like, being sought after and desired by college coaches, I can't think anybody would come close to Slug Drake. Yeah. So in, in the time he played, Slug Drake was um, – he was a high school All-American his senior year wow. by several publications, like first, yeah. pub, first Team All-American. He played in the Big 33 game twice. So back then, uh, the first year he made the Big 33 team, it wasn't an actual game. It was mm-hmm. just an all-star team. These are the best in Pennsylvania. That yeah. was his junior year. His senior year, they turned it into an actual game where – Tyron, or excuse me, where Pennsylvania's All Stars would play the best of the nation, wow. and they would play it in Hershey. He was the MVP of that game, <laughs> and then he played in several high school national All Star showcases that year. Wow. He was the MVP of those games. That is crazy. He was flown from colleges all across the country. He went to Texas. He went to Tennessee. He went to Purdue. He, he Penn State. He could have mm-hmm. gone anywhere. Initially, he was going to sign with Purdue. I think he wanted to play in the Big Ten. Yeah, and. Uh, to hear one of his classmates tell the story the night before he actually left for Purdue, yeah. Joe Paterno was just an assistant at Penn State then. Uh-huh. And he and Rip Engel drove to Tyrone, went to his house, and made one more plea to get him to go to Penn no State, way. and he did. And those days, freshmen weren't allowed to play on the varsity team in college. You had yeah. to sit out one year. And, but he dominated the team. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he was set to be a starter his sophomore season. Wow. And sort of like – and he'll tell you this story. You know, it's, it's been such a long time ago, and he's such a great guy. I don't think he's ashamed of anything in his life. But sort of like he, he didn't care that much about school. So yeah. his lack of care for school kind of led them to nudging him in the direction of like, hey, you need to take some time off from this so you can get yourself right yeah. and, and be a starter for us. Whenever that happened – Coaches from Tennessee came up to Pennsylvania and basically poached him and took him down there. <laughs> Jeez. And it's a crazy story. I mean, this is, again, this is in the book, but whenever I talked to him about it, like even my eyes were popping up, like, wow, that really happened? <laughs> he said, yeah, they came up to me that summer and they made me promises. They said, you'll have a car. They said, you'll have this and that. So, like, you go back to like, oh, the 1950s and this stuff was happening. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's crazy. And he played at Tennessee. I'm trying to think if he finished out that year, but what ended up happening was I think he just sort of burned out on mm-hmm. it. And, but it's a great story because he never intended to play football he was always a big kid but he never was really he never liked high school yeah he was a freshman all he wanted to do was get old enough to get out and join the army Mm -hmm. um and okay so if you go down to the american legion imagine if you're driving straight on lincoln avenue and the american legion's there and then across the street there's this place over here that used to be a gas station yeah he was just hanging out there with his buddies one day and the football team drove past because they used to practice up by great field Mm -hmm. and they drove past and um they, like, uh, stopped to get gas, and the coach just went over and was like, hey, you ever think about playing football? And that was how he got started playing football. Wow. But he's an amazing guy, and that was probably my favorite part because talking to him led me to talking to other people. Yeah. Like I traveled to Huntington to talk to Pete Sellers. I, there's a guy from that team that lives on my street that I talked to. So there's a lot mm-hmm. of interviews in that part. And, um, yeah, so that was an awful lot of fun, and I hope uh, he reads it and likes it. Yeah, 100%. So, uh on a, like, let's say a nightly basis, how long would you like spend actually writing this book? Because obviously you said you like started in quarantine and you finished it like yeah. fairly recently. So how long would you spend? If it was a summer night, anywhere from nine thirty or ten until three or three thirty. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've always been a late person. And then if it was a school night, nine nine thirty to maybe one. Like I, I, yeah. I always go to bed really late. So on a school night, even without writing a book, I would work until one and then uh, read mm-hmm. until one thirty. So. Wow, that's awesome. So uh, we can go to the journalist side of things. Obviously, you've been been to and wrote about plenty of uh, Tyrone football games. Can you tell me one of your like favorite Tyrone football moments you've had? Yeah. Um, let's see. Like most memorable would be probably, uh, and this is in there in 2004, whenever Tyrone was playing in the Western Final over in State College against mm-hmm. Grove City. No way. My dad was just telling me about this game, the card. The card. Yep. Game. So they had oh, that my. game one, and uh, and. All they had to do was stop Grove City from getting yeah. the first down, and they stopped them. And it's awesome because I talked to some guys on the team about it, and it's in there. But, like, L- Leonard Wilson tells the story. He's yeah. like, hey, I stopped the guy a yard short. <laughs> so he said, when I stopped him and I got up and tackled, I looked over, and I'm like, okay, it's a yard. He, and he was like, even after giving them a favorable spot, yeah. then, they, then they still measured it short. 
So if you were at that game, you would see everybody from Tyrone jumping up and cheering. Yeah. And I remember being in the stands. I was covering the game, so I'm supposed to be neutral. But even mm -hmm. I, I'm there with my dad. I, 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 <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, and then um, and then everything stopped, and all of a sudden they start measuring it again. I'm like, what are they doing? Yeah. And so that's probably the most memorable. But it, it's been so many. I don't know favorite moments. Like obviously winning the championship in '99 yeah. was was pretty cool. Seeing um. The team make it to the finals in 2011 was cool. Yeah, that there's, was a great there's team. There's been so many uh, great moments. But, yeah, I mean, as far as, like, favorite moments, I think back to whenever I was in high school and just seeing the older guys play. And yeah. you know how that is. Whenever you don't realize that you're going to be them someday, yeah. you just look up to them like, oh, those guys, not only are they my heroes, but those are, like, men. 100%. I, do, I actually really vividly remember this from, like, when I was, like, in middle school, actually. Mm -hmm. Kind of like your story. Like, I would look up to the football team like, wow. Yeah. Like, I want to aspire to be them. And it's funny because whenever it's you doing that, you think, like, man, these – these are like men. Yeah. These are some big dudes. But you then you get to that point and you're like, wow. Yeah, you don't look at it that way anymore. Yeah. So you don't look at your players on the football team. Like, yeah, and you're oh, like, they're oh, they're not huge. Yeah. But yeah, definitely the younger eyes. So uh, what advice would you uh, or would you have for some other young writers uh, to aspire to possibly write a book? Like, what would you tell them? I would say, um, I mean, it depends on what kind of book you want to write, but I think have a vision. So early on, I kind of, I, I don't know that I ever wrote an official outline for this, but I mm -hmm. definitely wrote down the chapters that were going to be. Yeah. That was my outline. Yeah. Um, but I think the biggest thing is just have some desire to do it. If you want to do mm -hmm. it, then do it. Go for it. And then uh, put it out there for people to see. But mm -hmm. but I think um, at the end of the day, all of these projects like this are things that you have to do it for your yourself, I guess, first. And I've always yeah. wanted to see if I could write a book. And, uh, you know, I would like to write about something else other than football. But yeah. this is the first thing that I knew. So I wrote about this. But but yeah, I think just have a vision, stick to it, and, and fall in love with that project, and don't worry too much about what other people think. But yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Other than that, people have kind of asked me that, and I don't know. I think desire is probably the most important thing. Yeah. Wow. So, um, is there another book in the uh, near future, possibly? I don't know about the near future. So uh, it was weird. Um, after this book was finished, I had spent literally, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, every day from March 13th until wow. right before Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. there was a portion of my day that was spent working on this book. So whenever it was published, uh, and then it becomes like, now what do I do? And yeah. I felt like a, like Shawshank Redemption. Like I'm like a prisoner <laughs> that got out of jail and yeah. I've had my life organized for so long. And now I'm like, okay, what, what am I supposed to do now? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, it was like a couple of nights where I just sat aimlessly. Yeah. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? And so I just put on newspapers.com and started scrolling through heralds from the 50s and 40s being like, <laughs> something will come to me. Yeah. Like, it's magic or something. And meanwhile, in the background, I'm trying to like, I'm like, okay, I can dedicate my life to something else. I'll just rewatch the entire Star Wars saga. So I'm doing yeah. that in the background. I, but I don't know. It's funny. Somebody at, at school the other day said, you should write a story about uh, your experiences as a teacher. I'm thinking like, who would want to read that? Like, who cares? But then I thought, yeah. oh, I kind of said the same thing about this book too. Like, who would actually want to read that? And people who have wanted to read yeah. it so far. So maybe I would do something like that. But I would like to write lots more books. Like, I think it's yeah. an awesome way to spend time. And it doesn't take a whole lot of time out of your yeah. uh, when the sun's up day. Mm -hmm. So um, I just like it. And I would like to do something else. What it would be, I don't know. If you have any ideas, yeah. tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Heck, we make a poll on the Aguirre or something. What should be the next book? Oh, yeah. That's, that's a good one because, I mean, again, this story is told in there, too. Like, the whole way that the name the Golden Eagles was established for Tyrone in the 1930s was through a student vote. Yeah. So the students voted on Golden, e Golden Eagles. So oh, wow. So if we want to have a... Again, I would think that poll <laughs> that poll would be similar to what I expected for the book. You'll get like five or six people that respond to that poll. So yeah, put that <laughs> poll up and see what six people think I should write about. Oh, there you go. So uh, where could people like viewers, they might want to purchase this book? Where could you purchase this book? Yeah, that's uh, definitely one thing I would recommend for young authors if you're aspiring to do a book. I wrote this entire book in Microsoft Word. Yeah. It's really DIY. Like a lot of the <laughs> pictures that I put in here were pictures that I had that I took a picture of with my phone and then I put them in here. Uh, it's crazy. Like this picture on the back, I had a friend design the cover for me and the picture of me on the back, yeah. he sent me a, um, an email one day. I was like, hey, we need your picture. Where can I get that? And I'm like, oh man. And his daughter goes to Bellwood. I was like, look in her yearbook and just take a picture of my yearbook picture. So he did that with his phone. So I mean, <laughs> technology, right? Oh, how about I would it? recommend to people, I did this 
through Amazon. And mm-hmm. I wrote the entire manuscript. And obviously, there's formatting you have to do to make it right. And then even after that, there's so many hoops you got to jump through so that everything's inside the lines. And yeah. you, you, it takes a long time. But anyway, it's worth it. And you can do it at no cost to you. Yeah. So people have said to me, um, how are you doing? Have you broken even yet? And I'm like, I, I mean, if I make $1 on this, I've w- more than broken even because mm-hmm. if you publish on Amazon, it costs you nothing to publish it because they only print it on demand. Yeah. So go to amazon.com, do a search for Tyrone football and you'll find it there. Mm-hmm. And whenever it first came out, it was actually, uh, the 219th best selling football book in the country. No way. <laughs> there you go. Darn right. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, uh, thank you very much for being on the podcast. It was great having you. It was Thank great you. talking to you. It. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day.